There were four perpetrators in my life. It started age four and five, um, went on for several years. The last time my dad threatened to kill me, I was 17. Uh, so it was quite a long period of time in, in that whole thing. Uh, my father was an abuser. There was a pedophile down the street. There was a, another offender around the corner. It was a nice, safe town. Thank you for joining us. My name is Heather Holbin West, and I'm the counselor at the Sexual Assault Response Center. We'll be talking about male sexual assault today. Today, I have with me Ted Cad. Uh, Ted has been with our agency for many years as an advocate and also a social change agent, bringing awareness uh, to the issue of male sexual assault as something that affects our community. Also with me is Michael Henry. Michael is a longtime mental health counselor. He specializes in treatment of sexual offenders as well as sexually aggressive youth. He's also been involved with our agency for many years. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start off first by inviting Ted to tell us some about his personal experiences uh, with sexual assault in his life. Well, the, the sexual abuse started when I was five, but there was an element that happened when I was four that was critical to that. My mother caught me and a friend uh, trying to examine each other's bodies, you know, the same kind of exploration that kids do. And she decided that that was perverted, and from there on, the sentence that I grew up with was, you're going to be just like your father. And she knew my father to be uh, perverted. Uh, she hated him as long as I can remember. So that was kind of the, the thing that was the background of the whole thing. When I was five, there was a neighbor around the corner who invited me into his house. I think it was a teenager. Uh, and he exposed himself to me and masturbated in front of me and then invited me to do the same. Um, about that same time, my dad started using me. Uh, punishment in our house was I would be told to go to my room and take my pants down and lean over the bed. And then my dad would come in with a wide belt and uh, hit me with the belt. Somewhere in that five, five and a half year old time frame, instead of the belt, he raped me. And that went on for several years. Um, he would tell me that he would kill me if I ever told anybody. And he would tell me that it would be more fun if I was a girl. Mm. When I was eight, I was walking down a nearby street and this fellow sitting on his porch called me by name. I didn't know how he would know my name, but it turned out that he had lived next door to me for a while. He invited me in and um, became a friend and there were comics and soda and that sort of thing. And then. Um, one time he kept me a little later by some ruse and then said, it's getting kind of late. Aren't your parents going to be worried? And I said, they don't care what I do. And that was exactly what he wanted to hear. Um, the next visit, he started um, the oral sex. And for some reason or other, he thought I was uh, past puberty when after some weeks he discovered that wasn't the case, then he switched to anal sex. Um, somehow I had the wherewithal to go back to him and say I didn't want to do that part. But um, he didn't understand what I was saying and decided that I was no longer of any use to him and he threw me out. Between my dad and, and this guy, I knew that I was dirty. I knew that I was unlovable. I knew, you know, all those things about, I was just not 
capable of living in society. I was just ugly and worthless. Um, but now what I felt was that I was so dirty that even the dirty people didn't want me. And so really shut down. Um, it's incredible to me that I had enough of a shell that I lived in that nobody knew. Um, I was an excellent student. I was involved in church and scouts. Um, there are a couple of places, a couple of times, on through uh, grade school and into junior high, where a teacher could have asked a question. There was a point in fourth grade where they knew something was definitely wrong, and that was just after the pedophile threw me out. Um, there was a point in junior high where I was having trouble with one teacher because she liked me and I was going to prove to her that I wasn't worth liking and she kept pursuing me and came came really close I think to finding out what had been going on. Um, there was one other offender, uh, female, when I was at her house she would uh, be there with other kids basically but she would call me to her bedroom and uh, she would be in her room um, jumping on these, one of these little mini trampolines kind of an exercise thing but she would be naked except for panties and then chide me actually kind of tease me about looking um, the really weird thing was that the last time that happened, uh, my girlfriend, my fiance, was with me, and that kind of threw her. I, I don't know. It was kind of weird. So, knowing what I knew about myself and about um, what I was worth and what I had done, um, it was 40 years before I could even begin to think that my wife loved me. We'd been married for 22 years at that point. I couldn't believe that she did that, that, she, that she, what she said about loving me was true because I knew better that I was unlovable. Unloved is not the word, but unlovable. Right. It just, uh, it's some, there's a lot of prices to be paid. And then, about 20 years ago, I was on a retreat weekend, uh, Christian renewal retreat kind of thing, and one of the pastors uh, was praying for different people, and when he came to me, he asked me what I wanted to be prayed for, and for some unbelievable reason, I mentioned the abuse. And when he started praying, um, the physical pain was incredibly intense. The emotional pain was was intense uh, to the point where I I blacked out. Um, it, w it was kind of a dissociation experience, not so much just blackout. I was aware of myself. I was not aware of my surroundings. I thought I had died. Eventually I came back to myself and there were several men kneeling around me praying. And for the first time in my life, I felt clean. It was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. And then, basically, I started to understand for the first time that this, the abuse had had an, an incredible impact in my life. I really didn't think it had any impact up until that point. That followed then several years of trying to work through all of this stuff. Um, I still haven't gotten a handle on the severity of what happened to me. Uh, my dad used a gun on me to keep me quiet, and in different places that I've had an opportunity to tell my story in small groups, um, people have actually I've heard audible gasps as they've talked about part, as I've talked about parts of my story, and I I didn't understand that it just what happened to me, but in the last year. Uh, I've begun to really 
figure that out. One person applied the word emotional terrorism, not just abuse, but emotional terrorism to what happened. Even then, um, a book I read recently said, it's not strong enough, it's not violent enough. You can't put the right words there, and, and that, I think, is the way I have to capture the effects of, of, the st of what happened, and it's still kind of hard. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having the strength to, sh to share your story. I think it's, it's similar to a lot of male victims and, and all victims in the things that they've been through, and I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us and the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn the conversation to you, Michael, and talk a little bit about some of the effects and how this process happens. Um, can you explain a little bit about the ways in which males are victimized um, by sexual assault? Well, sex, sexual assault or sexual abuse can be described or occurs in a lot of different ways more than people realize. And so sexual assault, generally speaking, it's any type of unwanted touch before the child is 18 years old. And it, sexual assault can also be broken down into um, hands-on and hands-off. And hands-on sexual abuse is molestation, which can be defined as touching of a child, of the male ki child, over the clothes or other types of, of the body for sexual purposes, not just touching like a parent would. Because right. sometimes parents get nervous. But any type of sexual touching. And, it, and when it happens, it's, it's pretty clear what it is. And a harmful kind and, of touch. And, and a harmful touch. And, and people will know, the kids know, when they become older. Um, any type of rape. Rape is defined legally as any sort of penetration, how slight, whether it's vaginally, innerly, orally or with any type of objects. And people have a misconception that rape has to be forceful and, and, and violent in the sense of overt violence. And typically, um, rape in a general sense with child abuse occurs without that type of extreme violence in general because the child isn't aware. And a lot of times, actually, the offender is trying to be discreet and not be disclosed. So it's the exception when there's extreme overt violence. There's also types of sex abuse that can be defined as exposure of the genitalia, um, exposing children, boys, to pornography. And there's types of abuse that could be described as exploitation, where the child is placed into prostitution as, at the early age. Most prostitutes as adults there were studies were done where eighty percent approximately were victims of sex abuse and they become prostitutes. So there's a long history of exploitation. Mm -hmm. And the, the child becomes older, the male kid for example, maybe maybe a runaway from home and and it leads into behaviors that he believes is natural for him because he doesn't have a clue, understands right. what's what's real. Right. Thank you. And I think the point that's so important is oftentimes it's not violent and there's a lot of um, coercion and psychological processes that, that go into that. So I'd like to ask right. you if you could explain that, um, that grooming process that a lot of times sexual offenders take their victims through prior to the assault. Okay. And but, but again, sex abuse, it's the, the definition is not consenting. Right. And consent means in Washington State over 16. And that's typically with the same age. So if someone is 25 and 16, we tend to take that very seriously. And so consent is one of the critical pieces of information which can be defined as age is one, able developmentally um, consistent with the other individual developmentally um, de process. Um, the, the other part of consent well, might be not drunk, not sleeping. So those are some elements. Conscious, they have to be. They have to be conscious and awake and able to give consent, even the same age. W one of the, f the fascinating factors of abuse, you mentioned a while ago, grooming. And grooming is, is very, very critical in understanding. Absolutely. Because grooming, I like to s describe grooming as courtship with adults. 
except with adults, they're consenting and they're fully aware and understand the motivation of the other individual, usually the same age, same social development, mature, same level, to 25 year olds. S one gives other one flowers, he person may have an idea, it, there's something behind that. Right. Most kids, especially boys, male children, don't have that emotional, social development to understand. So grooming can be described into three categories that I, I think about, psychological, physical, and sexual. Psychological could be broken down into emotional grooming. And some examples might be, I tend to also call it emotional roulette. I think early on we spoke about terrorism, but I mm -hmm. call it emotional roulette because in one contact can be extremely devastating to the, the child. And so emotional grooming or psycholo psychological grooming can be described as telling the child that you are a big kid, I, I will protect you. Um, no one will believe what you said. Um, lo lots of times the offender is someone in, uh, in power, authority, like a teacher, a coach. Anyone could be an offender uh, or capable of offending. Right. And the child is, is respects and looks up to this person, an authority figure. So the psychological, psychological grooming is one where the offender elicits or decreases the child's resistance and defenses by gifts, by telling the child that this is our little secret, no one will ever know, and I will protect you, and your parents won't care about you, they will punish you. And so it's, it's, a, it's a psychological warfare is taking mm -hmm. place. So the child is now indebted to this gr grown adult. Well, and as Ted said, mm -hmm. almost maybe sometimes sees them as a friend. Exactly. Or someone That's important the in their life. So not, not everyone who is trying to be, uh, who is a friend or uh, quote unquote, a good person is grooming. So there's a, right. there's, a <laughs> there's a flip side. And so not to get people too nervous. And so the other p level of grooming is, uh, might be is sexual grooming, which could be a form of exposing a child to pornography decreasing the, the child's resistance again. Um, it's, there's cases where I've seen cases where the, the father or the adult or the teacher or wh whoever it might be, might be exposing themselves, maybe masturbating, and with the full knowledge that the child is gonna walk by and see that. And if the child don't react to that, then the offender realizes he has gotten a step further in the grooming process. And he may elicit, he may draw the kid into that picture and s say, for example, let's play the game. Or the offender may leave the pornography out in the open and tell the child, look, watch that and let me know what you think. And the child, most five-year-olds, four-year-olds, 10-year-olds don't have awareness of the, the situation. So they will look and the, the, the grooming goes a, a little bit further such as, let's play a game, let's see um, if we can do things to each other to enjoy, for example. Um, for example, two erections with little boys. And so the little boy thinks it's a game, and, that's, and by the time the f offense is, is taking place, the child now is so much, doesn't know what's going on. And so the last question, I think what people ask the question is, why didn't you tell? And so the grooming process is so tremendous. The, the other area of grooming is f physical grooming, which could be in the form of tickling, wrestling, um, massages. And with the, the intent usually is how much, how far can I go? So typically if the, the boy is seven, eight, ten years old or, and says no and has some awareness, the offender will stop and say, I was, I was just kidding, it's a joke. We were just wrestling, especially if the parent intervenes. If the kid says nothing, the offender goes a little bit further. And so the physical grooming is a way to break down the, the boundaries or the barriers of the child to go a little bit further. So the grooming process is a, is a step where there's intentional intent for gratification and the child, by the time the sexual behavior act is taking place over a period of weeks, months, or years. The child believes that they are part of the, 
the relationship they're consenting and the mm -hmm. offender typically the emotional grooming is you're a great kid um, gifts um, you're special it could be a coach I'll take you out to show you some batting practice um, and so by the time the kid realizes it's too late for the kid to say something and now he becomes quiet and feels shame and guilt and responsible and so that's the sort of grooming process uh, is one of the ways that a fe sex abuse can be per perpetuated over a period of time without anyone knowing. Right, and I think that process is so important for community members to understand because it can be a very slow, strategic process that takes, um, you know, a period of months or years, as you've said, where the victim doesn't even notice that it's happening until it's too late, just as you said, where the actual um, sexual abuse happens, where, where maybe community right. members would consider that abuse, but maybe before that, all of this grooming has taken place without anybody noticing. And at the point the abuse occurs, the victim feels really involved, dependent, and their emotional and physical boundaries have been broken down to a point where they might be afraid to tell or ashamed to, to tell. So it can be really Correct. effective that way. And, and they, sometimes they might be threatened of harm, right. harm. Even if it's true or not, a five-year-old kid, four-year-old kid don't understand, especially the, a male kid, don't understand that that may be, just be a threat. Right. And even adults don't understand a threat is just a threat sometimes. We believe it's true. Absolutely, so. absolutely. If I may, I there's another aspect of that, which is the, the offender is very good at getting the child to think that they chose to do this. And so they are a participant both by the action and by the in impression that the offender leaves with them. This is something you wanted. Uh, okay. that's, so oh. if, I, if I were that, that's what happened with the pedophile down the street for me. I wanted it. I did what I wanted. So you think I'm going to tell anybody? <laughs> not at all. Of course not. No, uh -huh. absolutely. I think that's and such a good point. And it's true because one of the things offenders will say, if you don't like this, let me know. I will stop. Tell me when you, when you had enough of this and I will stop. So now the responsibility is in the child's hand to stop it. And so oftentimes they're, they're too young to handle that responsibility or maybe correct. even understand what that means. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll be returning with Benton County Prosecutor Andy Miller. should be happy and safe. Those who have been sexually abused are more likely to become pregnant, engage in violence, do poorly in school, run away from home, and have low self-esteem. If you're worried about a child, get involved. Call the Sexual Assault Response Center at 374-5391. Together we can make a difference in the life of a child. Call 374-5391. I'm joined by Benton County Prosecutor Andy Miller, and he's going to talk with us about male sexual assault in the legal system. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us how difficult it is to prosecute male sexual assault cases in our community? All sexual assault cases involving children are hard to prosecute because they typically are no witnesses. It tends to be the offender's word versus the victim's word. And so we, we start off with that challenge. And also people don't want to think that something like that happens. Sometimes it can get even more difficult when the victim is male because there's a lot of stereotypes and jokes about male victim assault, sexual assault. So that's one additional layer that um, we have in dealing with these cases. Okay, thanks. And 
you mentioned this a little bit, but how do you think those social stereotypes and myths about sexual abuse affect the case during the investigation and the prosecuting process, if you can give us a little bit more specific information? We're very fortunate that I think law enforcement officers and prosecutors have become very professional and have good attitudes about this. But we are aware of, of potential jurors and a lot of common people may say, I wish I could have been assaulted when I was 13 or 14. And there's a, lot, there's a feeling out there among a certain segment of our population that um, a 13-year-old or 14-year-old boy or 15-year-old boy may have pleasure from being a victim of a sexual assault. And so that is an attitude that we are, have to be aware of when um, we're working on these cases. But I want to emphasize that um, perhaps different than 20 or 30 years ago, um, I think our law enforcement officers are very sensitive about this issue and they investigate the cases in the same way they would investigate a case with a girl victim of sexual assault. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, in your experience, have you seen many cases uh, where offenders were held accountable in male sexual assault cases? Yes. Um, we just actually finished um, a relatively high profile case um, where the victim was a 14 year old boy. Um, we, we certainly don't have as many cases involving uh, male sexual victims coming into um, the court system, but um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't consider it a rarity either. Um, we all are used to working those cases. We're used to the extra challenge, and we are able to hold um, people accountable. And the thing to remember, too, is, is if you have a male victim of sexual assault, the offender may be female or the offender may be another male, and that um, raises some, um, some issues. But it's something that we work on. Um, they don't happen all the time, but they um, happen enough. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Is okay. there anything else that you think is important for our community to know in terms of the legal process? I think it's the fact that the legal system and the investigation system needs to handle these cases with a great deal of sensitivity and do an extra job of investigating so it doesn't become um, a question of the victim's word against the offender's word and that we need to do um, our part, like you are today, in educating the, um, the community that these types of crimes do happen and they, need to be, they do need to be treated seriously, and the offenders need to be held accountable. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank we you. appreciate it. Great. Children should be happy and safe. Those who have been sexually abused are more likely to become pregnant, engage in violence, do poorly in school, run away from home, and have low self-esteem. If you're worried about a child, get involved. Call the Sexual Assault Response Center at 374-5391. Together we can make a difference in the life of a child. Call 374-5391. Welcome back. I'm Heather Holbin West. I'm the counselor at the Sexual Assault Response Center. And I'm joined again by advocate and survivor Ted Cadd and mental health counselor Michael Henry. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. We're going to shift the conversation to discuss some of the psychological effects that can happen to male victims of assault and also talk about some of the myths in our society surrounding this issue. So Michael, can you explain some of the long-term effects that might happen um, or men might experience after being sexually assaulted? But there's, it's a wide range of effects or long term. There's a short and long term effects. Okay. Sometimes the short term effects might be fall into the category of psychological, whereby the child is in shock. Something happened that they were not aware of, but they did not know what was happening to them. So that's the first level, the short term effects. Sometimes kids might go into some serious trauma, like sleeping problems, eating problems academic problems, depends on the age, um, different types of physiological problems. For example, if, if a male child is abused sexually with, with intrusive behavior, meaning the anal 
penetration or oral penetration that affects his his or her his nutrition, like eating, um, going to the bathroom. Um, it's a lot of physical, psychological, med medical effects. The other, then we go into the long-term effects, which can be categorized uh, mainly in, with intimacy problems or relationship problems. And in general, most boys who are sexually abused, in, in general again, there's what I call stigma. There's a stigma attached to being a male victim. Because we raise kids, boys, to be strong and tough and to protect ourselves. And when, we, when we're growing up, our dads will say, oh, the, you're a big boy, you're going to protect mom, you're going to protect the family. Even at five years old, we get that message, which is different from, from the female gender. And so we believe that we can fight the world. So when we experience some sort of ex significant intrusion and we are helpless and powerless, it becomes a, a, a very shame-based and embarrassment as we grow older. And so one of the things men in general don't like to talk about problems, uh, with especially in, in treatment, right. you, know, you have to drag them. And so, <laughs> or drag us. <laughs> and so when we have to go talk about something as intimate as being abused sexually, it's, right. it's, it's a trauma. And, and if, if we go back to, to the fact that most five, six-year-old boys, generally speaking, don't have uh, critical information about their bodies from their parents. And for example, one of the relationship problems with intimacy is that when a, the male um, sexual organ, the penis, he has erections uh, from day one that is involuntary. And so that's one of the s major physical, sexual long-term problems is that something I did that caused this to happen if I if I didn't respond or was or there was some natural arousal because that's how our bodies are then something I did and so in, in, in regards to relationships it, it disrupts smooth I call it a smooth intimacy a smooth relationship development because with, with, with men, they either go a couple of ways. One way, they become very isolated emotionally and sexually and afraid of sexual activity because, gee, I was abused, which it kind of goes back to th that hidden agenda where in our culture there's men, there's homophobia. And so that's one of the criteria that we use that some, I have to be gay, I have to be homosexual for this to happen. So. There's that lack of confidence, and so the boys will either go up into men and go to one direction, avoiding relationships because of confusion, mm -hmm. or they may go the other way and become promiscuous to prove a point that I'm not gay, I'm a man, I'm str strong, I'm tough, and they become very sexualized at a younger age. Some men, very few men, I would say, which is a, a a myth, one of the myths, very few men turn into offenders. Actually, research shows. Right. And so what men will end up doing, becoming drug abusers, alcohol abuse, they may even either end up in becoming domestic violence perpetrators. And because of the fear of intimacy, closeness, and the lack of confidence in themselves that I'm okay. And it, so the, the, the men tend to grow up into adults thinking I'm not okay, I'm damaged. Um, that I think Ted said early on, being feeling unlovable, and not mm -hmm. they, uh, in the sense that they're trying to find this love, but they don't feel lovable, mm -hmm. so they push people away. Um, right. Uh, plus, in our society too, with with male victims, with they tend to respond differently with a female offender than a male offender. In in that, with female offenders, most young men are, are coach in a thought that it's okay to become sexual earlier with females, with older females. Actually, it's a chip on a lot of young men's shoulders. And whereas with men, male victims, the, so the dynamics are quite different in a, over the long period of time. Um, the, it's affected, but, but we, we, so we program young males that when you're abused by a female, which is, is not as, men, as much as men, that it's okay, that it's, it's part of your rites of passage 
to be sexual earlier with a female. And, and then so oftentimes you should feel lucky or... Be lu exactly. Right. So... Absolutely. When I think one thing that I've seen with a lot of the, the survivors that I've worked with is um, in the male survivors, there is that, uh, in almost all survivors, there's that shame, but in men it seems to be more because they are taught that they should be able to protect themselves in any situation, even if there's an adult that's much more powerful than them physically and emotionally. And um, also an increased sen in sense of embarrassment too, that they would have to come forward and say that this happened right. to them. So it can be difficult, more difficult, you know, for male survivors to come forward, absolutely. And having these effects, and maybe they realize they're connected to the assault, and maybe they don't, and they Correct. haven't connected the dots. As you were saying, you know, for a long time you didn't realize the impact it really did have on your life. And I think that can be difficult to realize, you know, coming to terms with that, that yes, this did affect me and I need to get help, right. and how do I do that as a male who's supposed to have all the answers? And over the long-term period of time with, with relationships, um, so, uh, so victims of sex abuse go through different stages of dealing with the, their trauma from young. They may push it back on the back burner. Mm -hmm. As they become older and they enter a, a serious relationship, it becomes more apparent that something is going on with, in my life, and they have to share it with their partner if it's a heter heterosexual relationship well a lot of women may not want to deal with that issue they may be part part of the problem not the solution they may think what's well, what's wrong with you can you protect yourself how are you going to protect me and it add, puts an added burden on males to ex explain um, because most women adults in the relationships who are naive or, or not informed mm -hmm. they may think well you're a man you should protect yourself and from the priest or from the coach or from the cop or from the neighbor or anyone. And it, it sets a tone where it disrupts the intimacy in that relationship also. Absolutely. F for me, I, I just pulled out. By the time I was seven, I just isolated myself from anything, family and other things. So there, there was no, no place to go. I couldn't talk to my mother because she thought I was perverted anyway and I certainly couldn't talk to my dad and I wasn't going to talk about it with anybody else. But then, you know, this this fear of being exposed, you go to the locker room and you hear all these words and you feel like you you're undressed in front of everybody because they're using mm -hmm. words that describe things that you've done and you don't want them to know that. Whether or not you have anything to do with homosexuality right. or fearing that you might be homosexual, those words are just not something you want to hear mm -hmm. because it sounds like they're talking about you. Well, and I would imagine, too, that brings up or triggers some of that stuff. And, mm -hmm. and the way that you're experiencing it is very different mm -hmm. than the conversations that they're having. That's right. You know, which can, again, make you feel really isolated and separate from everybody else, mm -hmm. especially your age. Um, you know, a lot of times, you did mention that most most males are assaulted um, when they're children, which can affect their normal sexual development. And we all have, um, you know, healthy sexuality and, and things that we need to explore and express as we get older. And so sometimes when, when males are abused, different things can happen, as you mentioned, um, one being the sexual reactivity. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Sex is one of the extremely difficult developmental process that everyone ex experiences. It's complicated. Very complicated. Yes. And so to add victimization or sexual abuse and, and that confusion and no one talks about it, it's just a, a tremendous burden on, on, on males to, first of all, to go through the natural, normal um, c confusion and then you add this on, it, it becomes a real problem. and. I've seen couples where the the men had dif real difficulties. They were they become addicted to pornography because that was the introduction to their sexuality, and they could relate to the screen or the computer much more because the the, the computer or the screen don't judge. They're not judging them or their performance or any type of confusion they may have. It's not reinforced. And, and so it leads to a high level of pornography, compulsion, and, and as opposed to intimacy with a mate. 
Well, and I think you spoke to it before, but sometimes when they're exposed to this at a young age, they may learn that masturbation or that kind of thing feels good. And so sometimes what I've seen is they learn that that helps them calm down, almost sometimes as a compulsion that they can't stop themselves from masturbating and sometimes exploring with other kids, which I think it's important to make a point that that doesn't mean that they're, they're then offenders. Um, it Correct. just means that, yes, they've learned that this they have more advanced knowledge of sex than kids their age, and maybe they learn that this is something that's helped them, or they, it, they do feel comfortable with that. Correct. And it's male victims tend to reenact with play, because the, the grooming, go back to the grooming process, it's telling the kid this is normal behavior. So, bef so sometimes before the offender is identified, the child is engaging in sexual behavior that it may not be appropriate, mm -hmm. but no one knows where it's coming from. And it's, it's a reenactment of what they have experienced, and the offender is long gone. And, and again, we spoke early on that male victims don't disclose uh, that easily. So they can go on for many, many years, and they could be punished for reenactment of sexual behavior, and because parents are not believing that boys can be abused. And so the, the assuming the boy is just a bad kid and he's doing dirty things and sex is dirty and, and then the kid goes untreated after a while. So Absolutely. Well, in your case, Ted, maybe you were, you were punished by your mother for what sounds like normal sexual exploration, right. which then led to abuse and maybe, you know, people not realizing, like you said, a couple people came close maybe to asking questions or figuring it out, but not really having the awareness or the tools to notice some of the red flags to look for, for kids who've been abused and realizing, yeah, it's not because they're bad, it's because of these experiences that they had. Yeah. All right. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the myths surrounding male sexual assault that are in our society, and I, I welcome you to join in. Um, the first one is, which we've already talked about, is that, that boys can't be victimized, and I, I think we've spoken to that a little bit in terms of um, that they can't always protect themselves, and they, they can go through a grooming process where they can become vulnerable to abuse, and just physiologically, our bodies are wired to respond when we're touched, even if we want that or not. Right. And so we can, you know, m males can find themselves in a place to be abused. Correct. And there is one in six men are abused um, before the age of 18, so there, which is a little bit less than the, the statistic for females, which is one in four. But again, there's not a lot of reporting, so I'm not sure, you know, yeah, it might I, be closer. Yeah. <laughs> one, one of the national studies says that 20% of the sexual assault victims in the in any given year are men. I think that says a lot. And that's a big number. Yeah, that is a, a very big number. Very big. And and when we then this goes into the myth, a lot of adult men can be abused or assaulted. Mm -hmm. but, and but I go right back to the jails and prisons, where it's it's frequent. There's a lot of men who were because they were victims early on in their lives. They they're physically weaker, they don't feel confident they, to protect themselves. And they are re victimized in a prison setting where it's not talked about, it's not it's disclosed, because they want to be seen as tough also in prison, but they cannot stop it. And so there's a high level of, of um, victimization in the jails and prison systems. And uh, it can be traced back to the victims being ab abused themselves and unable to stop it. Or protect themselves. Absolutely, and I think that's definitely one of the places that's not talked a lot about is is sexual assault within the jail system, and there could be added shame where there's even more pressure to be um, macho or manly and, and protect yourself, and it can be a very unsafe place. Correct, and then even I mean, one of the myths, because it's, it's, not, it's not always penetration. It could be grabbing right. a guy, guy's crush as he's walking by, and things that he may not think is abusive but it's, it's, it has an emotional effect. Within also. that spectrum of not right. necessarily, as you said in the beginning, things that we traditionally think would be assault, there's a much larger spectrum right. to what that in can include. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the myth that most sexual assault of boys is perpetrated by homosexual males. Um, we've touched on this a little bit, that homosexuality can be a big part of this, especially for male victims, and oftentimes in my work uh, with survivors, I've found that there is almost always a fear that they are homosexual, whether they are or not, when they're offended, you know, or assaulted by a same-sex offender. Um, 
And a lot of times, you know, people who molest boys aren't expressing a homosexual orientation more than a heterosexual. Um, it's about power and control, not necessarily, mm -hmm. you know, sexual gratification. And, you know, well, many offenders maybe have gender or age preferences mm -hmm. um, and who they offend against. A lot of times those that, that seek out boys um, and the vast majority aren't homosexuals. Correct. They're just offenders. I, I, I will agree with that. that most offenders, 95% of offenders, is someone the child knows and trusts. Right. To begin with, it could be anyone. And most offenders are described as um, it's, it's an opportunity. It's not the fact that they, uh, the, the offender is gay or has prefer boys. It's, a, it's an opportunity that they're choosing, and the boy happened to be available. And so, there's. I read studies that showed actually that there's a very low percentage of offenders are actually uh, gay, identified as gay adults. And I've been doing this work for 35 years, and I, it's rare when I see an offender, a male offender, who, who uh, describes himself as as being gay. It's, mm -hmm. it's very rare in in, um, in a clinical setting yeah. and my research. My father. Uh, molested his sister starting at age 13. He molested two of my female cousins, me. He tried to rape an adult woman. So he, he was kind of all over the map when it comes to, I think it was just anything for sex. The and it opportunity. Didn't it, it didn't make any difference, the sex or the age. Absolutely, yeah, I think that's a really important point and important for commu the community to know as well. Um, another myth is that um, boys are less traumatized by abuse than girls. And I guess in my work with victims, I, I don't find that to be true at all. I think, as you said, maybe male victims handle it differently in terms of substance abuse. There's a lot of different avoidance and numbing tools that they use, um, either isolating, withdrawing, using substances to sort of numb out. And a lot of times I've found that it just depends on, on the victim and the survivor and how they tend to handle things. Correct, I, I describe it as boys are more quiet. Right. About the, dis the victimization and the less disclosing. And, and so it, it, it gives an imbalance effect that boys, plus, I've seen many, many males who were abused by, well, they, they describe it as having sex with women who are twice their age. And, and their lives became very horrendous with drug abuse, um, several kids out to marriage, no relationship stability, and work problems, difficulties in life with relationships. And they don't see the connection. And they, they see it as an experience that was positive. But I can trace it back that it was a foundation that was laid that had a lack of boundaries, a lack of ability to go to someone and speak without being laughed at or, or, or embarrassed. And, and worse again with male offenders, with male victims, rarely would they run to the, a therapist's office or to their moms mm -hmm. or dads because it's not what men do. And so, so I, I see some men are more quiet about mm -hmm. pain right. and suffering. Not necessarily and meaning that they're not experiencing right. it. It's, it's, it's an internalized. Not men tend to internalize pain and suffering, and especially when it comes to sex abuse, mm -hmm. being a victim. Absolutely. I, I think because of that, because of the of closing in, going silent, and not talking, I think men actually perpetuate the harm that's been done to them. If it seems like women are more in, more willing to enter into a relationship to talk to somebody about it. And of course they've had an advantage over the last 20 years plus of the, of the subject being brought up, but men just continue to, to Correct. hide the harm. And that, that just continues it. And they don't have the opportunities to get the support and the tools that they need maybe mm -hmm. to manage things, which could, they could avoid a lot of pain mm -hmm. that way in whatever, you know, whatever setting that they feel comfortable getting that support and those tools in um, could, could, yeah, come to them a lot quicker, I guess, if they didn't feel the shame and the embarrassment because we don't talk about it. Um, another myth is that girls cannot perpetrate sexual assault against boys. And if a woman seduces a boy, as we said, it's considered a rite of passage. 
Um, and that a lot of times, I think what I found, just as you said, is that they don't know that it's sexual abuse. And oftentimes right. in, in newspaper articles and television doesn't use the word abuse when it's a, a female offender. They'll use the word sex or affair. Affairs, correct. Right. And it's, it's very um, significant level of men abuse when they were little younger teenagers, 12, 13, 14, by older babysitters, by older um, women. Because in our culture, there's a, gen a gender bias that women don't offend. And so when men are abused by a female compared to male, it's, it's much more easy to withhold that information. And, and most times, most women, when they're accused of abuse, the, the community are in shock because, in general, the, the, the communities don't believe women are capable of abusing boys. And it becomes, and so the boys are pushed further back into the males that if you, if you talk about this, you will seen as a, as a wimpy kid or not adequate anyway. And so it's, it's much, it happens quite often. And, and, and what we do see in, on the in TV and in the news is the most sensational cases that that, um, that occurs. But it's a lot of aunts, sisters, babysitters, uh, abusive that I've seen in my clinical practice. As you said, anyone can be an offender and exactly. take a victim through that that grooming process. And oftentimes, it can you know, be fine and, and making a family friend, that can be okay. And so that would be where it's important maybe to know some of those red flags. Right. Um, if you could maybe offer some of those to look for, what would you say would be important for maybe parents or caregivers or just people in the community to know and to look for in sexual assault? Hmm. As a form of prevention? Right, yeah, or yeah. Well, one of the things I, firstly, I always talk about is that we need to become a society of, of education, and that's to me that's the form of the greatest form of prevention is to educate kids mm -hmm. that about their bodies, about their bodies, about how it, the bodies work, and make it an open discussion like we talk about history and drug abuse and education and other types of topics. Somehow we leave sexual sexuality out of the picture. And so the kids are growing up with a lack of knowledge, a lack of competence to discuss the sexuality. So when offenders actually, that's what offenders will tell me, that they have a, they know when the kid is very vulnerable because there's no information that they can make a reference to. Because mom already said or dad, it's dirty, it's terrible. We don't talk about that stuff here in our house. So that would be the first prevention measure is to talk about it from day one, healthy sexuality from age appropriate. Um, I always would also s suggest that parents know who the kids are playing with and do sort of informal background checks. It, it, w it won't stop it, but it will give the parent some sort of awareness and that the kid is aware that the parent is being protective. So if my kid is gonna go to someone's house I'll, want, I'll talk to parents about what type of movies they watch, what's the level of standards in your home, in an open way. It's just, I mean, most people don't lend, if someone buys a brand new automobile, they don't just lend it to somebody to keep overnight. But we feel free to just give, drop kids off for two, three days and feel, okay, well, everything is fine. And, but it's, it's not. So we want to do some more digging into, and the kid, as they become older, they appreciate that. When they're 12, they will whine and, you don't trust me, and, and and so the kid at 20, they say, Mom, I, Dad, I appreciate you washing up for me. You were very pushy, but I, it, <laughs> it, 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 it helps. And don't feel guilty about it by making sh uh, talking to parents, whatever movies you watch. Mm -hmm. If they say, well, what's, that's your business, I say, well, my kid is my business. See, and be very firm about that type of prevention. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that a parent can do, it's not directly related to educating them about sex or about unhealthy touch or anything like that, but work hard to make sure your kids know that they can talk to you about anything. You know, 
and it's whether they lied at school or spilled something on the counter or whatever it is, it's okay to come and talk to me about it. I'm not going to overreact. Uh, I think that's one of the things that keeps kids from talking when it gets to uh, something serious. Right. If mama can't handle the fact that I took more milk than I should have or you know whatever it might be, you know, how am I going to tell her about this? Absolutely. So starting those relationships from the very beginning and open mm -hmm. communication and educating your child about sex, uh, you know, as as they develop in an age appropriate way. And then also, you know, being aware of, of where they are and digging. And I think it's important too as a parent to just go with your gut as well as, you know, the children. And if you have a feeling about somebody that maybe they're not safe or if there's some red flags in terms of them not respecting the child's boundaries or asking them to do mm -hmm. things that maybe make the child uncomfortable. Just going with that, you know, and making sure that they're they're protected. In addition to, you know, the more traditional prevention programs that talk about, right. as you said, the different types of touch and the grooming process and that kind of thing. I think that's so important, uh, you know. And and just to to close, I think I'd like to make a short note in terms of for for the male victims in the community as you said it's so important maybe for them to get the support and the help that they need and with more time I think I think the, the stigma of male sexual assault victims will decrease more and more and they, they hopefully will feel more comfortable to, to come out and disclose and get the support that they need um, and and just basic self-care like breathing and making sure you're taking time for yourself and and keeping your relationships positive relationships with other people can be so helpful um, is there anything that you guys would like to add in terms of that and, and caring for themselves to make sure that, that they're help, healthy and feel supported. I think um, when I first started working on my on the stuff myself, it was a very much female world, and uh, the sexual assault resources were female, and the agencies were focused on female. But I think the important thing to know now is that that's not true anymore. Absolutely. You can come and talk to somebody at SARC. You can come and talk to a counselor. Uh, and they understand it's it's possible to tell someone and and get to work on it it's not easy it certainly isn't easy but it's the first step is just really telling somebody and it's much more available to men now than it has been before absolutely well thank you so much Ted and thank you Michael for joining thank us you. today for more information you can reach the sexual assault response center at 509-374-5391 Thank you.